Thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to present this paper. Uh, did I just turn these off? Where's the advance? This one. Okay. Um, just one disclosure, this, uh, this, this uh, study was sponsored by Covidian, but I don't think it'll affect uh, any of the things that I'm going to say. Our group became interested in glucose tolerance testing when we noted a, a bunch of patients having weight regain following gastric bypass when we were involved in other clinical trials. And what we noted is that a lot of the patients were complaining about symptoms of reactive hypoglycemia um, and basically complaining of intermeal hunger, especially after they ate things that had simple carbohydrates. Consistent with that, this is the fact that there are new terms that have kind of become much more prob uh, common following gastric bypass, such as insidioblastosis, uh, non-insulinoma pancreatogenesis syndrome, or NIPS, or hyperinsulinemic and hypoglycemia, which were entities that were really rarely encountered um, by surgeons previous to this. And it cr creates something that's relatively counterintuitive. If the hallmark of medical therapy is preventing sharp rise in glucose and insulin surges, it would seem strange that the standard operation or the gold standard for bariatric surgery should be an operation that promotes fluctuations in hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia. We see a beautiful picture of the Mediterranean, and the hallmark of medical therapy now is kind of a Mediterranean diet or a diet that's low in simple carbohydrates, low on the glycemic index, and prevents these fluctuations. As a result, we decided to compare the three major stapling operations, gastric bypass, sleeve gastrectomy, and duodenal switch um, with glucose metabolism. I think it's important to point out that the way we do our duodenal switch, we preserve at least 125 centimeter common channel, so the bowel lengths are slightly higher. But this type of model gives us the ability to compare two operations that preserve the pyloric valve as well as two operations that have an intestinal bypass. There was a prospective non-randomized study. The patients had the choice to pick their operations and then were enrolled in the study. We had 38 patients that were uh, available for study, 45 enrolled and didn't complete the testing, uh, 13 in the bypass group, 12 in the sleeve group, and 13 in the DS group. Uh, glucose we did a glucose tolerance test with liquid oral challenge at baseline. At nine months, we gave a solid mixed meal muffin that had the same amount of carbohydrate and calculated all of the usual parameters. As you can see, all of the operations are very effective for weight loss. The only significant difference preoperatively was that the duodenal switch group was heavier um, but in terms of all of their glucose homeostasis parameters, fasting glucose, insulin, there was no significant difference. At 12 months, we can see a similar people have reported. The curves of bypass and sleeve are nearly identical, and the duodenal switch patients actually lost the most weight, and that was actually statistically significant. Here's where it really becomes interesting. All of the operations are very effective for reducing fasting uh, blood glucose levels. But when we stimulate with, with a glucose challenge, we can see that the gastric bypass group has a much higher one-hour glucose compared to the duodenal switch group on the bottom, um, with the sleeve behaving somewhat intermediary. This corresponds to a similar change in one-hour insulin, where we see in the gastric bypass actually the one-hour insulin rate going up to a level above preoperative levels, and we see real suppression in the duodenal switch group, meaning that the DS group is able to achieve euglycemia or have a lower glucose with less insulin production. When we look at this graphically, on the, the left side, we see this is the glucose tolerance test, blue baseline for gastric bypass. This is the six-month duration. You can see the curves are stable. And this is insulin production. You can see actually the insulin production going up even though it's starting at a lower level because the operations are effective. The gastric bypass is effective for lowering fasting insulin. We look at the DS curve and you see a completely different suppressed curve, meaning that the area under the curve for DS causes lower glucose with also having a lower area under the curve for insulin production. Fascinatingly to us, 
the sleeve behaves somewhat intermediary to the two operations, uh, meaning that pyloric preservation is not the sole reason this occurs. When we look at this in terms of ratios, in other words, what are you trying to prevent? So a one hour fasting glucose, to one hour to fasting glucose, meaning testing how fast the glucose spikes, you can see that the blue gastric bypass, we have a much higher ratio when compared to sleeve and especially to duodenal switch. Similarly, when we look at a graft to one hour insulin, it's even more profound that the slope in the rise of insulin from baseline to one hour following gastric bypass is really, really profound. So that you're seeing exactly what, you know, what we've seen in other studies, hyperinsulinemic hypoglycemia in response to a glucose challenge. With a solid test, it's somewhat ablated, but still significant, and at all data points, the data looks remarkably consistent. When you have high insulin, the next thing that's going to happen is the glucose is going to fall, and we know that hypoglycemia is a cause for people to get hunger. So when we look to, at the one to two hour glucose ratio, you can again see that gastric bypasses have the highest ratio, meaning that they have the highest one hour sugar and a lower two hour sugar. And I think that this begins to explain why we have intermeal hunger following gastric bypass. Now, we gave patients a questionnaire about symptoms. And I think the point of this is not that any of this is statistically significant because obviously this study was not powered to look at symptoms following the various operations. But if you look at it, the weakness and nausea and hunger and all the symptoms that we see in DS is certainly no greater than gastric bypass, meaning that we're not creating a group of people that have severe malnutrition and weakness. So in conclusion, all of the operations cause significant weight loss, a decline in fasting insulin, fasting glucose, and improved insulin sensitivity and hemoglobin A1C. As opposed to gastric bypass, the duodenal switch has a smaller rise in one hour glucose and insulin. The data is consistent at all time periods, and independent studies have confirmed normalization of glucose tolerance following duodenal switch, as well as we've seen numerous studies that have duplicated the abnormal glucose tolerance testing and gastric bypass that we've first presented at SAGES five years. VSG behaves intermediary to bypass and duodenal switch, meaning that pylor preserving the pylorus may be part of the explanation, but not the whole story. And obviously, control trials between a gastric bypass and a duodenal switch that is not too malabsorption are needed to determine the real long-term significance. And I think we should all be cautious before we label gastric bypass the gold standard operation. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this paper. Thanks, thanks, Mitch. That was pretty uh, interesting. Uh, Santi. Mitch, uh, awesome presentation. Uh, you're preaching to the choir. Uh, why, why should we do gastric bypass at all? Uh, this, this, this paper today and, and Phil Shower's paper with a random trial showing that uh, they are equally good and this paper really supporting outcomes that uh, are unheard of. Can you explain me why, why bypass should be an option in a patient? Because you see that guy sitting in the first row? If I said anything stronger in the conclusion, he would shoot me. Um, so that, that's, I, think, I think that to be perfectly honest, in our practice, we've actually moved, moved past the gastric bypass. So, you know, people ask me, who do I do switches on, so I'll, you know, and who I do, do, do sleeves on. I think for patients who have a BMI of 40, no profound di diabetes, um, no profound metabolic syndrome, sleeve, leave. For patients that are super morbidly obese or have profound insulin resistance, I think there's an advantage of adding the intestinal component. I think that people have been in denial. When we add the intestinal component, whether with bypass or duodenal switch, you're going to see vitamin D deficiency, you're going to be, see change in bone densities, and I think that a lot of the long-term morbidity comes, as Mason suggested many, many years ago. So in my hands, I believe that if you're going to add the intestinal component, you should get something for it. And I think we have to face the fact that in the gastric bypass, where we bypass very little intestine, we don't have a valve, we have rapid nutrient entry. I think the same mechanisms may explain some of the increasing alcoholism that we see. We're not getting very much for that intestinal bypass, and that's what the sleeve experience shows us. And I think that preserving the pylorus, and there may be a lot of different things which I don't have time to talk about, 
is a very important thing looking forward for a lot of research opportunity. Thank you. One, one, one minute. One, 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 one more question. question. So should, should we do a sleeve gastrectomy as a primary option and reserve those patients that don't do as well and we move them into a Duodena switch later? Short answer. Very reasonable, but we don't actually know that the sum of the parts is equal to the whole. And I think that we always assume it, but I think the one thing that we should take away from bariatric surgery is that it's a lot more than mechanical, and that's why more physiologic studies like this are important, and we just can't assume that one and one equals two. Thank you very much for that thought-provoking study.